Good afternoon and welcome everyone and thank you for joining us at our Council of the Ameri Americas Symposium Panel on Building a Sustainable and Resilient Private Sector in Latin America. My name is Susan Siegel and I'm President and CEO at the Americas Society Council of the Honor Americas and it's an honor to have you join us today. Today we're hosting our last Council of the American Symposium of the Year. Although 2020 presented many challenges around the world, we're proud to have hosted an incredible group of leaders and pioneers from the most important multi-Latinas and multinational corporations with business in Latin America as part of our symposium virtual series. We thank you all for your continued support. We are thrilled our long-term knowledge partners at Boston Consulting Group collaborated with us to build this program within the framework of their new book, Beyond Great, How to Build Sustainable Business Advantage in a World Where Great is No Longer Good Enough. Today, we are bringing together three leading CEOs who will share their perspective on the importance of sustainable and resilient companies as we look at the post-pandemic business environment, both globally and in Latin America. Our audience will have the opportunity to ask questions to our panelists towards the end of the program. When you do have the opportunity, please use the Q&A box that appears on your screen and the moderator will read the questions for you. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Bank of America, the AES Corporation, MasterCard, SAP, Softech, Chubb Latin America, HSBC Securities, and Microsoft, our partners at the Inter-American Development Bank, and our media partners, America's Quarterly, CNN in Espanol, and the Financial Times. With that, I welcome Jim Her Hemmerling, our moderator today, co-author of the book, Beyond Great, and Managing Director and Senior Partner at BCG. Welcome, Jim, and thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you so much, Susan. Hugely appreciate this opportunity and to be joined by such a distinguished panel. I'm going to uh, just share my presentation now, which hopefully will come up. And there it is, perfect. And uh, let me also just add my warm welcome to Arun, Julian, and Roberto who I've gotten to know over the last while and uh, really appreciate all of you coming today. And I'm sure our guests are all looking forward to hearing what you have to say. What I'm gonna do is spend a few minutes to just put in play the context of Beyond Great in order to set the framework for the discussion. And then what we'll do is we'll quickly move to a panel discussion. And so be please be thinking about your questions throughout. So the book, Beyond Great, Nine Strategies for Thriving in an era of social tension, economic nationalism, and technological revolution. The book was just launched on uh, the 6th of October, so it's hot off the press, as they say. And uh, we're very excited about the, the sales so far. And also, I would say it's, it's already generating a lot of very interesting discussions amongst our clients, um, which, of course, we hoped it would. In terms of the book itself, uh, the first chapter is really a book about framing the new context of a new world era that has emerged. We define this around three disruptive forces. Um, the first is social tension. And think about this as climate change, the, the strain on the natural ecosystem, but also a lot of pressure around rising inequality and also interestingly, you know, discontent with capitalism that we haven't seen for a long time. And uh, I'm even thinking of a, a book that's just been published, Reimagining, Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire, which I think, you know, speaks to the heart of that aspect of it. Economic nationalism, I was based in China from 2000 to 2007 and led our practice there. And in 2008, I actually published a book with a colleague of mine called Globality, competing with everyone from everywhere for everything. And at that time, what was very clear is globalization was a good thing and the more of it, the better. And it really was a universally embraced framework. But of course, fast forward to today, just you know, a little over a decade later, and you all know there's a lot of pressure on globalization. And even the term globalist now in many circles is viewed as a derogatory term. 
So that uh, is clearly another force. And then the third is technological revolution. All around us, we see the challenges of people that are embracing and racing to catch up and work with this new set of digital technologies. Now, what I would also say is people ask, what about COVID-19? And it is true that much of the research for the book was, was done in advance of COVID. But what I would say is, in our sense, is that what COVID has done is it's just reinforced exactly the forces that we were talking about, and if anything, has pulled them forward by five to 10 years. So we're just seeing a, an acceleration of social tension, economic nationalism, and technological revolution. So I think as we set out in the book, uh, we wanted a book that was both timely, but also timeless. And I think it's certainly proving to be very timely. What this new era then led us to ponder was really two fundamental strategic questions. The first is how do you actually define what it is that is outstanding performance? And then the second is how do you build sustainable business advantage in this new era? And those two questions really informed everything that we have, have done. As we were preparing for the book, our research, which really took place over the past two to three years, what I would say is we did not go into our research with a strong hypothesis of the answer because we wanted the interviews and the data to inform what the answer actually was. And, and so what we did is we conducted over 100 interviews and we also did extensive research into companies that we felt were actually demonstrating leading edge practices or were already on the journey beyond great. The other thing I would say is in the book, we've deliberately tried to avoid the, the consulting tendency, which is to write a book that is all about frameworks and theories and concepts, and instead have written a book that really is grounded in real stories of leaders like yourselves who are grappling with these, these, these realities. And so I think you'll find the book, if you haven't read it yet, to be a very rich set of stories. From that, um, and we had a chance once the book was written to step back and say, to do a word cloud. You know, what is the book actually about? And as you can see, yes, it is a book that is global in nature. Um, but of course, most companies, at least, you know, Fortune or, or S&P 1200 companies like your Swells are global companies. But what I would also say is some other themes really stand out. I would draw your attention to the book is a very strong emphasis on being digital. It's about data, it's, it's products, but it's also very much about services. It's also about a book about customers and the importance of customers. You'll also see a very strong emphasis throughout on talent. I mean, there's a chapter, Thrive with Talent, but that really runs throughout the entire book. And then not surprisingly, a very strong emphasis on leadership. So those are some of the themes you will find um, in the book. But of course, this isn't a very organized picture. And so we did bring an overall framework to the findings from our research. So let me synthesize it this way. Great was really defined by delivering outstanding total shareholder return. And while we never directly referenced the book, Good to Great, those of you that are familiar with it will know that the book published 20 years ago defined great by those companies that delivered great returns for shareholders. Also, if you look at the essence of, of great, it was about great products and services, but also leveraging economies of scale with a focus on efficiency. If you go to beyond great, the first very strong position we take is that while shareholders are still very important, it's not enough to just focus on shareholders. You need to deliver outstanding benefits to all stakeholders, to customers, to employees, to suppliers, and of course, to society more broadly. Also, to be thinking about sources of advantage, sustainable sources of business advantage that go beyond products and services and scale to things like resilience and agility. And you'll see those themes running throughout. So then how do you get from great to beyond great? Well, what we've done is we've organized the, the book around nine chapters, nine strategies for thriving in this new era, organized around three themes, growing beyond, operating beyond, and organizing beyond. And again, those three themes really naturally emerged from the, the research in the book. 
So if I just click down in behind those just a little bit, the nine strategies are really as follows. So growing beyond, first of all, we take a position that growth is incredibly important. And if you look at it from returns or to have an impact on society more broadly, growth is important. The first position we take is do good, grow beyond. So what this is really about is to grow with purpose, to build what we call TSI, total societal impact, into the, the, the strategies around creating total shareholder return, but also to be thinking of how do we embed impact on society more broadly into our core operations. So it's not enough just to have CSR activities off to the side, it needs to become core to your business. The second is around stream it, don't ship it. So what we get at here is the idea of, particularly for companies that are still making physical products, the importance of layering onto those physical products, products and services and experiences augmented by digital technologies. And so a strong emphasis on, on a, a broader um, value proposition, if you will. And then the third element around refining your global game. As I said, I was based in China in the 2000s. At that point, the ethos of globalization was to go everywhere to find every market and to expand, expand universally. Also, the focus was to expand with, a, with your own assets, manufacturing and distribution assets. What we're really seeing now, these leading edge companies, what they have done is they've found ways to actually be more selective in the markets that they choose to participate in and also to leverage assets of third parties that you don't always have to go with your own manufacturing and distribution assets. So that's the essence of growing beyond. Operating beyond starts with embracing the idea of ecosystems, that it's not any longer about just the resources that you have within you know, the four walls of your company or even, even your bilateral relationships with suppliers but it really is embracing a multilateral network of partnerships. And there you'll see us use examples like Volkswagen with over 50 suppliers and part of their network, or Ant Financial out of China, having over a hundred partners in an ecosystem that expands globally. So that's the first point or the importance of ecosystems. Actually, we just had Thomas Friedman speak to our partnership last week and one of the themes that he emphasized as well was the importance of ecosystems. Strategy five, flex how you make it. Think of this as um, in the past, particularly for any product that required a low cost, um, it, the, the idea was move it to China or maybe move it to India or maybe move it to a, another low cost location. What we're seeing now is actually companies that are embracing a multi-local flexible delivery network so that they will companies like Kata Consultancy Services. It's no longer just about putting all of their services and their people in India, but they actually have now over 200 centers, hubs around the world. Each one of them is delivering different value propositions that are networked together. Very importantly, part of the driving force behind this as well is to take advantage of talent pools that exist in different locations, as well as proximity to end markets. It's also a very important part if you think about resiliency. One of the things we've seen during COVID-19 is a sudden new awareness of the importance of having resilient supply chains, as we've seen supply chains for even basic things like, like uh, masks um, having been completely disrupted. And it's created a whole new awareness. So that's really flex how you make it. Let your data run through it. The point we make here is that when we look at many companies, many companies are still looking at data as essentially exhaust that comes from their business. And then the exhaust, the exhaust from your car goes off into the atmosphere and is of no value. What we're seeing though is companies that are flipping that and really viewing data as fuel that drives both their product offering, but also their operations. 
And how do you embed the use of data and analytics through everything that you do in your operating model? So that's the essence of, of operating beyond. And then the third part of the book is organizing beyond. And here, and we'll want to get into the discussion quickly, so I'll be brief here. The first part of this, think of this around the design of organizations. The dominant design of organizations for decades has been the matrix. And most global companies have embraced the matrix in some form or another. What we're seeing now is the emergence of a new organization design really built around three things. It's built around being focused very relentlessly on the customer, moving away from geography and product as the primary axis. So a company like Unilever, for instance, has developed now 240 customer category business teams. So they've really created a set of micro customer organizations around the world. They've even done away with the regional structure in order to take away the distance from the customer. Fast refers to agile. And many of you would be in some way, shape or form embracing forms of agile. Small cross-functional nimble teams working on very specific problems empowered to not only do design and development, but also to deliver um, value added services for customers. And then the third element of flat. This has two meanings behind it. Flat as in fewer layers in the hierarchy, and we've certainly seen companies continuing to do that. A, a company like ByteDance out of China, for instance, has over a hundred people reporting into the CEO in the top two layers of the company. So it's a very flat organization, but the other element of flat is to be embracing technology and data platforms that enable horizontal collaboration and communication. So that's a very important element of being flat. In the book, you'll also see that in behind the structure is a culture that embraces flexibility, agility, empowerment, and so on. So that's really the chapter on, on org design. Eight is thriving with talent. And what we do here is we primarily focus on really the battle for the talent that is primarily defined around the bundle of digital talent. People that are very comfortable working with technology, using digital tools, and even operating in, in agile ways of working. This chapter is about how do you attract them? How do you inspire them? But then also how do you reskill and upskill the talent in this relentless battle to be having the talent that you need to operate in an environment that is, is defined more by digital data and analytics. And then the ninth chapter, if you think about the environment that we're in, one that is constantly changing and being disrupted, what it suggests is that we're in an environment now of constant change. We used to think about transformation as a one-off. You would set up a transformation execute it over 12 to 18 months, and then return to business as usual. That era is gone. And what we're seeing now is company after company are realizing that transformation is really now the new normal. And so what they're doing is looking for how do we embed this? Some have actually incorporated now a chief transformation officer as part of a core part of operating. Others have embraced a transformation management office as a core part of operating. But what we talk about here is that in an environment of constant change, it's not just enough to have the right leadership or to have a, 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 a transformation management office. You also have to reimagine how you actually conduct transformation. And in this chapter, we draw very heavily on work with Microsoft around a concept that they call the head heart and hands of transformation. And this fills all the way into even how they think about the role of leaders. The leader is to create clarity, to generate energy and deliver success, head, heart and hands. And so this chapter talks about how do you change the way you think about leading a company through transformation. So that is a very quick overview. Um, I hope it's helpful in setting the context I hope it hasn't dissuaded you from now going and buying the book. 
But uh, with that as context, what I'd like to do now is to begin to, uh, to open up the broader conversation with our panelists. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about growing beyond. And so as you know, um, this is those three elements. Do good, grow beyond, stream it, don't ship it, and then refine your global game. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite our panelists now to make sure that they're unmuted and uh, we'll open up. And Roberto, I'll, I'll send the first question to you. Many companies talk about a, a triple bottom line or, or, or in some way doing good and growing beyond, but you are actually doing it and you've been doing it since Natura was created. So what has your leadership done? to really move beyond words to, to action. So uh, thank you again for having me. Uh, thank you for the invite from uh, from the Americans Forum Council uh, and thank them for, for the question. Uh, and again, congrats on the book, which um, we all have a, a lot to learn from it and, and be inspired by it. Uh, listen, you know, within Natura, this has been part of the DNA of the company, as you said, from, from the beginning, from the founders of Natura 50 years ago, that always had this vision that the things are interconnected, the interdependence of things. So even though we talk about the triple bottom line, it's even more important to see how they actually connect to one another. Right, so it is about you know thinking the economic, the environment, and the society as a whole in a very holistic way. And and but how that becomes, to your point, tangible, it is uh, comes from starting coming from the top, right? Coming from the boardroom uh, where you know those things are discussed. Those things are part, for example, of our strategic planning. Uh, interesting enough, every quarter report that we do uh, to investors, we talk about sustainability. It's uh, we try to put uh, the same discipline as we measure market share gain, or as we measure net income, or or return on the investment. We try to measure how much we're doing in terms of becoming carbon neutral, and and our goal to become net zero by 2030. What are the key indicators in terms of uh, circularity? You know, our goal to become, you know, a, a full package in circularity. So what, what are the things that we need to do? So it is about really understanding that those things are somehow interconnected. That they are part of the, of the whole, of the same. But then also being very disciplined about it, right? Uh, um, one of the things that I, I, I strongly believe that it, what's making this core to our group, even though each one of the companies are in different stages, but they are embracing this. You know, very recently we just got ESOP now also as a B Corp certified. Uh, as we have Natura, we have the Body Shop, and 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 hopefully in, in the next couple of years we have Avon. It is really the focus, the attention, and the discipline uh, 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 that we have across the board. So again, you know, the scientists they have calculators. Every time they are formulating, they know the impact on the environment. They know the impact on the carbon emission. And every time that they are formulating a problem, so you start really embedding that as part of just how you run a business. Yeah, that's fantastic. And uh, how you've how you've embedded it basically into your operating model that it's it's not it's not just something off to the side, but it's very core. Could you just take one moment, maybe, for people that are less familiar with a B Corp? What does it take to become certified as a B Corp? So, so B Corp uh, is probably the highest uh, standard in terms of uh, governance and, and sustainability metrics. Uh, and, and it is something that uh, we believe is very important. A lot of companies are, you know, uh, getting more and more into the process of being certified as a B Corp. Natura was the first public traded company to become a B Corp certified. Um, and it's really about, again, it is about embedding in your governance. It is about embedding in your process, the thinking, the methodology, how you're tracking, how you're ensuring that it's sustainable, that it's not just one-off. 
how you make sure that it's part of just the way you run the business versus being like a a, 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 a side or just a department or something that you check the box that you have in the company and, and then you move on doing everything, you know, on the financial side. So uh, it, it is very uh, uh, important because it, it helps the companies with some capabilities in how to get there because it's a process, it's a journey, right? It took us many, many years to, to get the certification and, 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 and but it's once you get it, it's interesting that they, the, the, normally the way they say it is just at the starting of the journey. That's not the end of the journey. And you get yeah. the certification, you're starting that journey, but you're starting with the right process and with the right capabilities. Yeah, I love that actually. And that's a little bit of a theme in, in uh, Beyond Great, which is that there's, it's, it's beyond, but it's, it's not just an end state. It's a, it's a state of being. You're always moving beyond. Correct. Right? That's right. Yeah. Right. Super. Aaron Anglo American has also, you know, always had a focus on on social societal impact, um, the importance of license to operate in all of the places that you operate around the world. Um, you have something around a a future smart mining model and and a phrase reimagining mining to improve people's lives. I'm wondering if you could just comment on that and and you know feel free also to build on anything that Roberto has has said. Hi, Jim. Uh, firstly, thanks for having me. Uh, much appreciate the, the time. Secondly, congratulations on the book. It, it really is a good read and, and very insightful. Thank you. Uh, so our, our purpose, Reimagine Mining to Improve People's Lives, comes from the need to develop the mining industry in a way that, that better aligns with the challenges we face today as a society. Mining has developed in many ways. We strongly believe there is a need for fundamental change. Historically, the industry approach has been to mitigate headwinds by implementing a bigger is better mentality. This is not sustainable. We need to make fundamental changes and we really need to do this now. Our Future Smart program is driving this change. It's about moving our business to be conscious and connected with its environment. It's about developing innovative solutions, fostering new ways of thinking, and transforming, transforming the way of working. In reality, we've taken our purpose and designed a concrete and clear roadmap, our sustainable mining plan. This plan has precise and challenging goals to continue improving environmental performance, contribute to the development of communities near our operations, and advance to even higher levels of corporate transparency. It is ultimately the way we hold ourselves to account to deliver the ambitious targets we've set. And it's highlighted by a few key objectives, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 30%, improving energy efficiency by 30%, reducing freshwater intake by 50%, and promoting that 20% of public schools in our host communities have the best performance in the countries in which we operate. Wow. In China, we are advancing very well and have made some significant progress, pleasingly. We developed a new water management strategy that allowed us to reduce consumption of fresh water 40% in 2019. We designed a pioneer model, an educational approach that seeks to turn the schools neighboring our, neighboring our operations into true centers of innovation. And we've committed 100% to renewable energy in our operations from 2021. I guess you could best summarize our purpose as being focused on the way our business can positively impact the holistic needs of society. Reimagining mining to improve people's lives is a strong mandate and a huge responsibility. But I believe if we materialize the intent, we will have better jobs, better education, and better businesses. Ultimately, we'll have a brighter and healthier future that benefits billions of people around the world who depend on our products every single day. Wow, yeah, thank you. What really strikes me, Aaron, is the boldness of the, of the metric that you have, you know, the, the, the big, hairy, audacious goals that you put in place, you know, across a range of different aspects around energy, emissions, around water consumption, 
but even even improving schools, I found that very striking. And and Julian, Julian, maybe just if you could just build on that. I mean, it's one thing it's one thing to put forward those bold goals, but quite often what companies then wrestle with is. Yeah, but what about the the long term? That's good, but in the short term, isn't there a trade off against short term profitability? And how do we think about that? How do we how do we get our leaders aligned around that? I know that's something that you've wrestled with. If you could maybe comment on that. Yes, thank you, Jim. And, and and first, let me thank the council for the invitation, no? and, and, and you for the book. I, I haven't read it all. I, mean, I, I told you, I'm halfway there, and I told everybody who's listening. It's a lot more than what you just told, uh, gave us in the presentation. They should go and buy it. It's, it's, a, it's a very good way of finishing. Hopefully, we'll finish it off this weekend. Uh, this, this dichotomy, the long term versus the long, uh, the short term versus the long term, or sustainability versus unsustainability, if you want to put it in. You know, where are we? I mean, let's start with something that, that in the case of the electricity sector, the power sector where I work, uh, today, you know, that, that economy has gone away, you know? It's clear, there is very, very, very clear that the businesses that make the most sense financially in the short term are the ones, you know, renewable batteries, new technologies are the ones that are, are gonna provide you, are gonna provide you the more sustainable, gonna help, the, you know, are gonna combat the uh, uh, climate change, are gonna reduce the carbon emissions of the of our customers. So, so that's very much the case today. However, that has not always been the case. No, that, you know, this is something that has evolved as we have seen renewal prices come down, battery prices come down, as we have seen our customer change their, 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 their preferences. But what, you know, what we have learned from, from this is that, and you know, when, when we have seen this process happen in our industry, and this is something that, you know, I mean, it, I, I'm sure that other industries are going to go through the same, so maybe something I can share with you is that first, business cycles are a lot faster than what they were. So what, 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 do, what do I mean by that? The long term is not that far away, you know? So it becomes the short term suddenly. It doesn't happen, you know, and, and we have seen it in our industry where new technologies come in and from one day to another, they dominate the market. They dominate the market and they change the, the whole structure of the system. So first thing, when you, when anybody's looking at something and saying, hey, it's a sustainable solution that's going to help the environment. It's going to help people. They're going to make the world better. And you bought, you know, it's a little bit too expensive, but it doesn't work. Or my old traditional works or works better. I will tell you, be very, very careful. Because you're probably missing something. And there will probably, you one day will wake up and you'll find out that, you know, the whole market has moved on there. On there. So, and, and I think that's, you know, the, the, the main message of this, you know, I think that the only way to have a, a business strategy that works in the long term, not short or long term, but it works, is that you need to ensure you, you have to make money. There's no doubt, you know, nobody here. I don't believe it. I don't know any, I'm sure no one believes that the only way to, to be, if you're a private company, you, your objective is to provide you know, financial return to your investors. So that's in our nature as a company. Great. You know, we're not foundations, we're not governments, we're not communities, we're not, you know, we're, we're a you know, for profit company. But the only way to ensure that you can deliver profits, that you can make it, is that you need to ensure you have business models that do help everyone, your customers first and meet their, their needs. The society that surrounds you, you know, the people who are next to you, your the schools near you, the people who are you are affected, the, the communities that, that are, are, are around you, the, the environment, that's something that's become more and more important. Every time you, if you have, by, by any chance, and there are less and less every day, but if you have a business model that is not based on those concepts where you cannot see the real value you can deliver, to your customers, to your shareholders, to your communities, to your own employees, to the people who work with you, to the to the people that depend on you for for you know that, that are connected to you, then go and review it. Go ahead and review it today. Why? Because you wake up one day and you know that it won't be that far away, and you'll figure out that somebody has to figure out a better way to do this, and and you'll be out of business. So I think there's you know my, my view is that. There's a false dichotomy between the short and the long term. You know, it, it's false. You know, the first, as I said, the the the, the long term is a lot closer than people think, 
and and because the, the business cycles are shorter and you know unsustainable business models that do not need do not create value for society do not have very very short legs very very short legs. so that, that that will be our, our point and we we track with them i mean I, i'm not going to tell you even though that this is a decision that as you said this is a, it's a journey we still today when we look at stuff you know we need to constantly think ourselves how to do this you know what's the best way what's the better technology how to resolve these problems but it never ends you know because they, they, as we move forward we ask ourselves for more stuff too. and you know in a way we believe technology is the one that drives this at the end of the day but you know it, it, it is if you are not on top of it you 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 you'll be surprised and and, and you'll create you'll create problems for your your for all your stakeholders you know including your shareholders so Right. I love the way you put that. In a way, you know, the future is faster than you think. It's it's closer. It's closer than you think. And so it's not really about long term and short term. You've got to do what's essentially what's right. What's right for the customer, for the employees, for society and for your shareholders. And it's not about short term versus long term. I think that's very powerful. Well, guys, we could spend a lot more time talking about growing beyond, but I'm going to move us along to operating beyond. And uh, you'll recall, um, those of you that were listening to what I said earlier, uh, Operating Beyond for us really has three parts to it. One is around engineering an, an ecosystem. The second part is around you know, flexing how you make it and thinking about the importance of resilience, but then also letting data run through your operations, that it's not just exhaust uh, that comes out and is lost, but it's actually core to how you operate your business. So. Arun, this is something that you know Anglo, I know, has has worked really hard at, and you've been thinking a lot about how do you leverage data and analytics to be core part of how you actually operate the company. And maybe you could uh, just talk a little bit about what motivated you to elevate the importance of data, and how have you gone about doing that? Yeah, so I guess for us, in terms of future mining, we. We see a future that's that's more predictable, more stable, and more capable. Ultimately, that's the fundamentals of our operating model, the heart of our organization, and I think the key point around what data really means for our business. We know that where we've applied the, the operating model, we get significant benefits. Our planned work productivity is about 30% more predictable and more productive than unplanned work. So what we know is we have to be prepared, we have to be predictable, we have to be stable, and data really really drives the way in which we do that. It, it is critical for us uh, with, with our future smart programs. We've, we've made significant strides in data over the last few years to the point where we now use digital twins at all of our assets. We used advanced says control, which really is looking at variability and saying, how do we how do we mitigate the variability so that it becomes a lot more stable, a lot more predictable? Uh, we're in the final throes of constructing our first integrated remote office, which is for us a, a very exciting uh, initiative whereby we will have the opportunity for the first time in, in Latin America to operate one of our assets from a major center, so the Los Bronces mine, uh, which is about 50 kilometers from, from Santiago, we will be operating from next February uh, from the Santiago office. So, so that's pretty exciting for us. Uh, we've also used data, I guess, to, to fast track and interested in, you know, Julian and the, the comments about the cycles are so much quicker now. Really fast tracking performance uh, we've used data to establish a global benchmark process that, that isn't Anglo-specific, it's anywhere in the world, and we just look to who's doing what better than we are, what can we learn, and, and how do we rapidly deploy that. So obviously you can imagine data is critical to being able to get those, those learnings quickly and move them into the business uh, to materialise value. We also, and, and I think importantly, you touched on resilience, we, we really see data having a huge impact in resilience. We know in, in Chile particularly, we, we struggle with, or we have struggled particularly with, with drought for the last five years. It's, it's had a huge impact on business. And so we're now using data 
to develop climate change models that better manage climate change challenges. We've also benefited greatly from remote working, and and I know that we've we've touched on it in different ways. But but the simple fact of having people connected uh, when they're not physically present has has been for us hugely beneficial both during the riots, and I guess that was a, a soft introduction uh, for want of better words to to the rigors and challenges that came with COVID. So all in all, remote work connectivity, data management and connected people for us, I think, really speaks uh, by the virtues of what we've been able to to deliver during what's been a very challenging uh, last 12 months. Wow. So it sounds like, yeah, for you, data, I mean, as, as we say, let the data run through it. It sounds like it's running through all of your operations. And I love the way you talk about the benefits of stability, predictability, resilience, and then, of course, the ability to actually operate remotely all depended on technology and, and, and data. Julian, um, maybe you could just pick up on that a little bit. You know, just the theme of, of resilience in the face of uncertainty, which is something that I know you wrestle a lot with as well. Yeah, maybe I can have two approaches to the question. One related to technology and, and, and renewals, and then the other one related to business models, which are, you know, a little bit different, but, but I think that, that will answer the first one. As you know, we we are we we know that the future of energy, especially electricity, will be renewables. However, there are huge challenges in connecting renewables to the, the system. You know, systems that you know, if you go beyond a certain level, the systems become stable. There's a difficulty connecting. So, this has been a major challenge that we have accepted for ourselves. You know, our, our, our mission as a company is how to accelerate the future, how to ensure that we can have a resilient power system that provides electricity at the lowest environmental cost or zero emissions. No? And we've been working very, very hard on that. And, and you know, we believe that the solution goes through the use of batteries in, in, in the utility system and that the use of batteries is going to be an important driver of ensuring that the systems can sustain, that can become fully renewable. No? And so we've been working on two fronts. One is using batteries as part of our solar projects, you know, so put it or, or, or wind projects or renewable projects, so ensuring that you can manage the production over time. You know, so we have done, we have few projects all around the, the globe. We, we started it also here in, in South America. In two fronts, one is for for solar and wind through what some people call enhanced solar or enhanced wind that adds capacity to ensure that you can move the the electricity production to when it's needed. And the other one was what we call the virtual reservoir, which is it's run of the river plants, you know, run of the, so we don't have to build dams. You don't build dams anymore. You use a run of the river plants and you keep the water or the electricity in this case in, in, in batteries and you can then produce it and use the, the batteries as a tank as a, or as a reservoir. And, but we believe there is a lot more to do going forward on this, you know, and I know it to be because there's no way, no way of meeting our objective of having a zero emission system without major technology breakthroughs, no? and, and, and that's what we were working on. And we believe that the, the, what we have done with batteries is a way to, with our opinion. You know, there are a lot of people working with all different concepts. So we believe that batteries will provide that difference that will allow us to do So that's one. The other one is connected to resilience is our sector has changed completely. You know? The barriers to entry have changed. Our customers are asking for different things. So it, it is clear that we're going to have a system going forward that's going to be more renewable, more digital. But the business models that are going to work in that system are, are, are going to change completely. And you know that for us creates a, a huge challenge. You know we're used to providing our, our services in a way. So how to do it in a way? How to ensure that you are aligning with what the customers or the people or everybody needs. And, 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 you know, we have looked at many things, but I think that what our, our current view and the view that we have is that the only way to really build the, the business models that are going to work in the future is to be work very, very closely with our customers. Not listening to what they want, no, which will sound bad, but it's listening to what they need, which is different. You know, people sometimes want something, but they, they, when you really think about it, the real need is something very, very different. And working very, very hard and trying, and that this requires a very 
trustworthy relationship with our customers, no, which requires time. It doesn't happen one, you know, one day to another. It requires some time. It requires really, really getting close enough so you can really understand not what they want, which is what usually they, they, what, what the customer does. Oh, I need, you know, I, I want this. I will need a contract. And, you know, they say I need, but it's really what they want. But you really need to understand what is a need. What is a need they need to, that, that they really need to, to, to meet. And then think about, okay, that need, how do I can, how can I fix it? You know, how can I address it? Do I have a capability? Is it, and build business models around that to ensure that we will have a business, an industry that will adapt to what's coming. That's going to be completely different five years from now, you know, completely, completely different. You know? So I'll tell you that those two concepts. One is a technology will provide resilience to the sector and we've been working very, very hard. It's probably the things that we we'll spend the most time on. And then the other one is, hey, how to ensure that we will be relevant in the new architecture, you know, and then working hard with the customers, getting creating a trustworthy relationship. If you know, if, if you don't create that, there's no way of building and listening to their needs rather than their wants. And that 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 at the end helps make it happen. So Yeah, I love that. So even as you're thinking about operating beyond, you're you're going beyond to think about the business model and ultimately the customer. And uh, I think that that's very, very powerful. Hey, Roberto, one thing we haven't talked about so much yet, I mean, we've talked a lot about data and resilience, but we haven't talked yet about ecosystems. And I think that, you know, you've done some work as well, thinking about your network of partners and building an ecosystem. And maybe you could talk about that for a, for a couple of minutes for, for our audience. Yeah, no, it was great to hear and Julian and Aaron because uh, I I completely agree. I mean, there are a couple of things that comes to mind that are, are are so important for us, and we continue to learn and be inspired by others on that. But this notion of resilience and agility, and 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 ecosystems on networks, right? And 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 the way we normally see is you know we we touch two hundred million customers. Right, and over a network of 3,000 stores, over 6 million consultants and representatives, right, and 40,000 associates. And then we have, uh, you know, thousands of partners. Uh, so that's the ecosystem, right? And how we, and how we, how we work with that ecosystem to make them as much agile as possible. And, 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 and the resilience of the model, it's what really is being remarkable, even in this pandemic. Of course, we've been impacted, but, um, you know, I think our results are being really outstanding. And, and, and the reason for that is exactly the agility and the resilience and the mindset of a network and an ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. Because even, again, if you think about our 6 million consultants and representatives, right? We are in a business of relationships. It is just that in the past, that relationship, what, what used people to call door to door, which was only done in the physical space. But that model, that ecosystem evolved to now social selling, which is the same relationship, but now done through social platforms. Mm. And what was, we were able to do it is to pivot that model with agility uh, uh, in order to be able to provide the capabilities to, to those, you know, micro influencers uh, to be able to continue to be successful, even in, in a world that they could actually not, you know, physically move as much as they used to be before uh, COVID. And, and it's mm -hmm. interesting that it becomes like a win, win, win. You know, they increase their, you know, the social inclusion for them mm. by being more digital savvy. Wow. It helps wow. the company and, and, and it helps the customers. So, and that's, again, going back to the notion that those things are all interconnected. It's not just looking at one or the other, but it's the whole, right? Uh, we just came out with a, a, a proprietary payment service for that ecosystem, for them, which is going to make them more productive. But here's one thing that is also, it's an inclusion play. 30% in Brazil of their representatives do not have a bank account. Mm. By providing that, 
you're you're making them more part of society. And and at the same time, they're going to be more productive. They're going to do more business. So it's a win, win, win. Uh, uh, it's not just two wins, win, 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 three, right? So it's the company <laughs> and it's, uh, it's the customer. So I, I think this whole notion of resilience, this whole notion of agility and ecosystem, again, it's so important. Uh, uh, and it is something that, you know, we still have a long way to go but, uh, in how we better manage the data, how we better, you know, uh, equip our our teams and 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 and, and our groups to, to actually power that. But it is an unlock in terms of competitive advantage. And I think you actually referred to that in your book, Jim. Wow, Roberto, I love how you, uh, you've, you're knitting together so many of the pieces, you know, that these strategies aren't just independent because you're talking about being more inclusive and giving people an opportunity to participate when they couldn't, which is really, you know, an aspect of, you know, do good, grow beyond. You've talked about the importance of ecosystems and making a more resilient operating, operating model but also you alluded to platforms, you know, creating a play payment platform is an element of, of what we call a new organization, you know, built around right. the customer, around agility and, and platform. So I love the way your answer to that one question starts to show how these different strategies come together. Look, I wish we had more time just to stay on operating beyond, but now we already are moving to organizing beyond. And, uh, Julian, maybe maybe just picking up on that, and and you remember the themes are around, you know, the organization design around customer teams and agility and platforms. It's around thriving with talent. It's around always transforming. Maybe you could just talk about, you know, how have you been experimenting with concepts around customer teams, agile, and and maybe platforms even. Yeah, yeah. This this topic goes to our heart, you know, right now. We. As innovation and, and, and in this environment we're in, where things are changing constantly, you know, technology drivers are changing the industry, these new business goals are coming in. We realized that there was no way we could we can compete or be successful uh, with a normal organizational position, you know, either matrix or whatever. You know, but the, 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 the all normal doesn't work anymore. So started thinking about this in, in the company and, and, and we realized that. We, we needed a, a new way of thinking of how do we are more than organized the way we work. And, you know, we, we identified that clearly we needed cooperation to be a major or collaboration, a major element of what we do, co-creation. You know, a lot of calls, you know, cooperation, cooperation, collaboration, co-creation. So the first thing we did, which, you know, well, we realized that we, this is a major change in the way we work as a company. You know, we changed our values. We went out and decided hey, we need to have as one of our values this concept of working together, working together internally, and working together with the, with our ecosystem. To use your your, your, your language, and, and when we we added this, you know, this specific concept. We added a new one that we re redefine our values. You know, safety, which is very very important in an industry for obvious reasons. We create high standards to represent all the elements related to compliance, meeting our commitments, stuff. But we added this new value called working, you know, all together, working together to ensure that it reflected that, their ability to work together, to really, and, and now in our communications, as it is a new value, we are spending a lot of time, you know, identifying these opportunities, ensuring that it happened. And you know, communicating to the to the global company, to, to everybody, you know, sees this as, as you know, the one the CEO to talk about them, you know, to reflect these behaviors inside the company. And now we're gonna go through a process of putting it into our hiring process. Because you know, there's no way you can come with, with these innovative solutions in an environment that's changing all of the time, just thinking that the commercial team is gonna do it, or the financial team is gonna do it, or the operational team is gonna do it. We still have that, you know, we're organized that way. So, but we, we are constantly moving to creating this, this, this concept of working together, all together, to ensure that, that, that we make it happen. So, you know, it goes to our heart, you know, at this point, because it's, it's a major change in the company. I'm not going to tell you we're there yet, but, yeah. but you know, we're, we're committed to doing it, to making it happen. And, and, sure. and then not only internally, also externally, you know, you have to create these trust relationships. 
with the community, with our partners, with our with our customers, with the government. Very, very important. Trust becomes the, the most important word in how do you in you know relate to the outside world. So in order to go in order to identify needs, in order to be sure that you can identify risks and opportunities as you move forward. Super, thank you. By the way, I mentioned Thomas Friedman spoke to our partners last week. Another theme of his, by the way, was trust. That this entire new way of working uh, requires even more of an emphasis on trust. It's interesting that you brought that in, Julian. It also requires it also requires having the right talent. And uh, I mean, all of you could talk about this. Aaron, I'll, I'll just go to you maybe on this one, which is how are you thinking about bridging this huge gap that most companies, you know, particularly more traditional companies are facing in how to close the, the digital gap of attracting, inspiring, and upskilling the talent that you need. Sorry, just had a couple of challenges with the mute button. Look, I think, to be honest, you know, we we have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. and. And what we're what we're really seeing with the future of work, and I guess COVID COVID's had so many negative impacts, uh, but but positive impacts are it's really enabled a new way of thinking, a new way in challenging ourselves as organisations. And we've we've heard Roberto and Julian talk about what that's meant for their organisations, and and I think for for us, you know, we're we're probably in exactly the same space. Maybe looking at it a little bit differently, but but generally speaking, we see we see three key things for the future. We see the future of work, which is which is very different to what it is today. We see future skills, which, to tell you the truth, we we don't have all the answers for what those future skills are. Mining is, is no longer just engineers and and miners digging holes and planting holes and and delivering what we think is important because we know the value chain has, has increased significantly. And we also see the future location of work as something that, that is very interesting. And, and particularly, I touched on the IROC. I, I think that's the first step for us. You know, we've, we've been heavily looking at the future of work and trying to understand what the organisation wants. And when I say organisation, I'm talking about the, the first year, second year, third year employees that ultimately will become the future of our business. Right. And, and they very different uh, pathways to, to what I saw when, when I started in the industry. And, you know, there's, there's a, a very good story about a young lady that said to me, well, within 10 years, I'm, I'm going to live three months of the year in Chile, three months in Paris, three months in New York, and then the other three, well, I'll just decide wherever that is and, and where I want to go. For, for us, I think that was really, really interesting that it starts to think about, you know, people have this in their mind now and how quickly we adapt and how quickly we, we understand what that looks like will ultimately determine how successful we are in that process. For us, you know, just talking a, a bit larger scale about the change on what that future is, mm. we had the GMC and the CEO basically shift the senior management focus to not be presiding. And, and I think it was a key change for our business that it was no longer acceptable that you're just there to deliver the strategy of the board. You're actually required to deliver the purpose, to deliver the burning ambition, and ultimately that encompasses absolutely everything. So it's been a, a very good catalyst for, for serious change and the mindset shift that, that came with that was immediately noticeable. Mm. You could say that overnight we, we lost our excuse base and, and we, couldn't, <laughs> we could no longer rely on that's not really my, my accountability. Uh, but, but I think with that we've really focused on accountability and empowerment and I think that's giving a lot of energy to or given a lot of energy uh, to the organisation and particularly to our people when we think about those those three key things of of future of work, future workplace and future skills. Yeah, I love that. It, it's the way you talk about it. It's it's not just an incremental change in mindset and the way you're acting. It's it's a pretty fundamental change 
you know, if anything, pulled forward and unlocked by by the current, you know, virtual way of way of working. Roberto, you're also, you know, in an environment where you're constantly innovating, constantly changing. And, you know, you talk about that having to be just really part of the DNA of, of how you operate. Maybe you could just, you know, build a little bit on what Aaron was talking about, about constant change and how do you build that into the company? Yeah. I mean, this is probably one of the most uh, passion subjects for me personally, but uh, uh, I, I, I do think that, again, one key attribute of leaders uh, right now will continue to be in the future is humility and capacity to, to listen and, and the realization that you don't know what you don't know. Right. And but, uh, you know, I'll give you the example on our 2030 sustainability agenda we call commitment to life. We set very ambitious goal. Right. So when you talk about full circularity of packaging, 90 percent of formulas are renewable or biodegradable. When you talk about getting 2030 uh, uh, net carbon emissions zero at the three scopes, scope one, two and three, which has never been done right in, in, in a company like ours. If you ask me, do we know how to get there? The answer is, I don't. Uh, 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 but I know that if we can set those very ambitious targets and, and work through the ecosystem, recruiting the right capabilities internally and externally with partners, that also drives innovation. One of the things that some people disassociate is, is sustain sustainable agenda drives innovation. And innovation also drives growth and revenue for the company. Again, those, those two things are interconnected, right? Uh, uh, but it, it is also very important uh, uh, to be able to dream high and, and then also realize that you're going to need others. I need leaders that are much better than I am. And, and I surround myself with people that are much better than I am to make sure that they can actually solve those challenges. And it's not maybe not even going to be their generation, it's going to be even the younger generation and people from outside and very disruptive thinking. To your point, you know, early on in Nature & Co, we created, you know, a transformational officer. And I remember that even when we created that, a lot of people say, what exactly does he do? You know, <laughs> uh, 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 what is what that job description? And, and, and because it is this notion that we needed to constantly be challenging ourselves. But I do think that one key aspect of that is this notion of humility and listening and understanding that you don't know what you don't know and ask for help, right? And, and you need to ask for help and reach out to other stakeholders uh, 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 in a very multilateral approach. And you talk about that in your book, uh, uh, because I think that's the only way that we're going to solve for some of those very challenging uh, 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 um, things that we still need to do in our lifetime. Awesome. Look, I, uh, I love the fact that, you know, as you've answered the questions, you've naturally reflected on what does it mean for leaders? And uh, the last chapter in our book is Beyond, Beyond Great Leadership. But rather than me talking to that, what I'd like to do is invite and open us up to, um, to questions now. And we have a, a question, the first question from Christina Palmaca, president of SAP Latin America and Caribbean. So Christina, if you could unmute yourself, I think you have a question for us or for the panel. Yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful, well, wonderful panel, wonderful book. I'm, I'm uh, almost finishing as well. It's amazing to see leaders like that uh, discussing that. Uh, and now my question goes to Roberto. Roberto, I'm here in Brazil, so we know about the DNA for Natura. Uh, we know the, the legacy that is here. Uh, but you guys are in a very strong uh, expansion and uh, international expansion. So it that doesn't go only about different companies, cultures and uh, organizations. So to your point, how do you bring this owner DNA, the Natura DNA that was pretty strong from the beginning and expand yeah, for different companies, different perspective? Uh, well, I have a lot of questions for you guys, but I'll, I'll focus on this one because probably in, in a global um, uh, moment, moment like that, and we are challenging the global approach, how, how do you bring this DNA 
across the other organizations. And congrats for the journey. Thank you, Christina. Uh, thank you for the question. And uh, uh, listen, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, it is a journey, number one. And 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 each company that is now part of the Natura Co Group is in a different stage of that journey. Uh, one thing, you know, we call a common denominator, you know, which is all those four companies were very lucky that they're all purposely led in different ways, but they share the vision that, uh, you know, it's all about, you know, this notion of all stakeholders uh, uh, and then expressing a very different way, but they all come from their own founders. Uh, 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 and, and again, in different stages related to each one of those elements. We are trying to, again, align them under the same vision of 2030 commitment to life. So our sustainability agenda, our commitment now, includes all business as part of the group. So when we talk about full circularity of packaging by 2030, that is pretty much across all business of the group. Uh, when we talk about becoming net zero, we talk about all business part of the group. Right, which is very daunting to the point that I mentioned early. You know, we don't know exactly how we're going to get there, but we, we keep giving steps in the right direction. And the B Corp certification helps a lot on that. So Natura is being B Corp. Body Shop was certified last year, and Isop just got the certification this year. So now we're going to work uh, to make sure that Avon also become B Corp. So that's how we approach: is going, you know, working the ecosystem, working some criteria, but creating very specific common denominators. And for us, is this Agenda 2030 Sustainability Vision. Super. Thank you, Thank Christina, you. for that for that great question. And uh, Roberto, your answer. We have another question from uh, Alejandro Anderlich, the Government Affairs Lead for Latin America for Salesforce. So Alejandro, if you would uh, unmute yourself and then uh, turn on your camera and ask your question. Maybe while we're waiting, if. Yeah, there we go. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So good Thursday, uh, everyone. Thanks for a great panel. Uh, I can't agree more with all that you've said. And now connecting the dots and uh, noticing that going bigger and great is certainly going from words to action and from, you know, going beyond our belly buttons and our silos and going beyond we are doing this to doing this together, right? So we have this great opportunity now to be relevant and to accelerate growth in the region uh, in an inclusive manner, in a way where no one would be left behind. So uh, I believe a strong leadership requires also determination to work in a collaborative manner, like uh, we've been, uh, you know, discussing. So uh, taking the issue of employability, uh, the, 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 the employment opportunities that we have throughout the region and the need that the region has uh, to create more jobs. What would be a starting point to start working together uh, as an ecosystem, you know, try to go beyond our ecosystem and try to think of a bigger ecosystem like Latin America as a whole mm -hmm. and go for a, you know, a kickoff in trying to imagine how would be the future of work together uh, uh, today uh, and us being, you know, uh, the ones kicking off uh, this uh, co-creation of new employment opportunities so that we can start tomorrow uh, going beyond words. Well, guys, I would say anyone feel free to take that one. It's fantastic, actually. Uh, sort of a challenge put back to you of how can you see opportunities to perhaps collaborate together to uh, do good and uh, grow beyond. I love that. My view, if I can maybe give you, I think it's the first step of building a relationship where you can co-create 
either one or uh, multilateral, like, like Alejandro was proposing, is creating trust. And that requires, you know, in my opinion, it requires working, in, in understanding your relationships very, very different. You know, if, if you know, you, you know you're not creating trust when your lawyer needs to read the document before you go to a meeting. You know, and you have the they, <laughs> that tell you what you say and what you cannot say. That makes it very, very difficult to create trust. So you require, you know, you you know to create trust, you require to be vulnerable and you know, the other part hopefully will engage with you. So that will be as I think Alejandro, my, my what I believe is the first step in building in building this new world that we want to build, no? And it's easier said than done. Easier said than done. It's clearly, no, no, no doubt. And, and, and it's, a, it's a challenge, you know? They are, related, they are transactional relationships which are not based on trust. They are based on, on, on documents and contracts and prices and stuff. And you need to try to move away from that in a way that, that you can look at a bigger picture. Yeah, I mean, if I can add also, Alex, I mean, I think it's a great challenge. Uh, I think it is about being inclusive and thinking in a multilateral approach with all stakeholders, right? And so, you know, one thing that we did for the first time it was a little bit of surprise for everybody. When we launched our 2030 Commitment to Life, instead of just having a call with investors, we created a call with the civil society. And we invited NGOs, we invited governments, we invited our competitors to be on the call because the idea of a multilateral approach, if you really want to focus on all stakeholder approach versus just shareholder, it's the walk the talk. We needed to reach out to them as well. We need to bring academia. We, we need to bring science. We need to bring NGOs. We need to bring governance. We need to bring the industry, our competitors together. Uh, uh, to find the solutions for those problems. You know, the idea that uh, the unilateralism, either one government or one company or one leader will be able to find the answers, it's over. And, and I think this crisis has demonstrated that in many different instances, that all the things are somehow interconnected. And if we don't have a multilateral approach for those things, we're not going to be able to find the solutions. I love that. And actually from your founding, there was the ethos that everything is connected um, that, you, that you've talked about. Arun, do you have a, a parting thought for the group? Yeah, just, just I guess one, one quick thought. I think it's a very good question from Alejandro. And for me, I, I think, you know, excluding what, what Julian and Roberto have already said, uh, the future really is going to move from business to business to become more business to consumer. And, and for me, I think that's where the opportunity lies, specifically when we talk about the LATAM region and, and growing those interdependencies and opportunities. It's really about understanding what, what do we see of the future? How does that value chain change? And what are the opportunities that rest within that new world as to how we could potentially come together? You know, we, we in copper obviously focus a lot around recycling and, and the circular economy of, of recycling copper. We also look at, at hydrogen and the future of green hydrogen particularly. And when you, when you look at some of the opportunities in Chile, and while Julian and I, I, I can say we haven't built a, a complete trust as yet, we've only had one engagement. One of the discussions we did have previously in, in our only meeting was around what does that future look like for, for AES and, and particularly Anglo and where do those synergies lie about opportunities that we could bring, particularly to Chile at that time, but, but I think in the future to Peru as well and potentially Brazil. Uh, and, and how do we align that with, with what society really does need, require and more importantly want in the future? Uh, so, so great question. Uh, I think there's more unknowns than knowns, but but I think there's some some really positive starting points that that could potentially grow that into something more. Awesome, team. We're at time. Julian, Roberto, Aaron, I really want to thank you. You've been just wonderful, wonderful participants, and have given so much uh, wisdom from your experience. And I love where we ended, which is 
this challenge to really think about how can we how can we go beyond great, not just as individual companies, but to do that together. I just love that that spirit and that that challenge. And on that note, I'm going to pass it back to Maria to close us out. Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much for moderating this panel. And very grateful to Roberto, Aaron, uh, Julian for joining us this afternoon because leadership and collaboration is more important than ever. Uh, this year, we've hosted over 50 CEO speakers, reached over 1,600 leaders throughout the Americas, and garnered over 370,000 views of our symposium and Bravo leadership, virtual, serious, of course. And one thing has become clear to us, that building a more resilient, agile, and sustainable private sector that delivers value to all stakeholders is a key mandate for CEOs across the region. And a theme we will definitely continue to focus on as we go into 2021. So Jim, congratulations on your book. I think it is very timely. Um, and again, really thank you to all the, the distinguished panel. We hope you will join us again in the new year and hope everyone stays well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.